looking at John Wesley. Looking uh, at a lecture on John Wesley, and I hope that you find this a blessing. Uh, just getting my notes ready. I tried to do it, but something went wrong with the um, with the internet there. So we'll start again with the lecture. Let's come before the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your grace and your love, and we give you the praise and the glory. And Father, we pray that you will bless this lecture and that, Father, it would be a blessing, encouragement to people, that it would strengthen their faith and help them to walk in your ways and to evangelize in your name for your glory. Give me the help by the Holy Spirit, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay. The 1700s was in a moral dis disintegration. Literature is a good example of the evil of the day. The plays and novels were regarded by society as a source of titillation. Things were so bad that there was even a society that drank to the devil's health. Poor folk were addicted to gin and the preachers were moralists with no spiritual zeal. But we must not overlook the political and social factors. Population growth from 1750 on rose from 5.1 million to 9 million 30% of the people worked in domestic workshops. Quote, Skeverton Wood, the second half of the century was indeed a troubled and divisive period, and not only politics, more wars, more tax, taxes, more causes for discontent were added to the strains of a changing economy and society. John, families, John, John Wesley's Family Heritage a noble line of gospel preaching. John's great-grandfather was a Puritan of the Commonwealth who studied under John Owen, the great Congregationalist theologian. His great-grandfather was ejected from his church in 1662. On John's mother's side, his grandfather, Dr. Samuel Ainsley, was a famous preacher at St. Giles in London, and it was from his mother and father that John was brought up in a devout Anglican, as a devout Anglican, but drank from the milk of his mum's Puritan roots. Quote, Skeventon Wood, the effect of his mingled Anglican and Puritan heritage on John Wesley was marked. He remained a Church of England man to his dying day with a strong sense of discipline uh, and a desire to bring about reform from within. He loved the liturgy and was persuaded that the articles and homilies enshrined the essentials of the evangelical faith. Yet as he pursued his task of mission, we find him adopt him expedient the third of his nonconformist ancestors. His overriding concern was for the good of souls, and where existing church order stood in his way, he did not hesitate to set it aside. The rebel under the skin would keep bursting through. The foundational years. It was in 1709, age five, that John was snatched from the fire of Epworth Rectory. This left a mark on John for the rest of his life. For him, it meant he was destined for some amazing God-given task. His mum, Susanna, nurtured John's sense of destiny by giving him a special education. As a boy, John revealed he had no aptitude for logic, which was to stand him in good stead as he used the gift as an... As a boy, John revealed he had an aptitude for logic, which was to stand him in good stead as he used this gift as an apologist for the revival. In 1724, John Wesley graduated at Oxford with a B.A. from another to desire to know more about religion. It was this year that he was ordained a deacon in the Church of England, from where John started to preach. He visited many churches in all kinds of weather, and this was excellent training for the future evangelist. In 1726, John was elected Fellow of Lincoln College. This is important as it provided an income for him so he could be an evangelist. From 1729 to 1735, as tutor at Oxford, John developed the gift as editor. This was to help him in the revival ministry, in preparing for books for his preachers. The Quest for Assurance In 1725, John was restless. He was in search for spiritual assurance. His mother challenged him as to where he stood with God. He read the Apostolic Fathers. He read Jeremy Taylor, William Law and Thomas Kempis. 
that this search was leading to despair. John's search for assurance continued up until 1734. He was about to die and he sent for John and he challenged him to think about his ministry. The family put more pressure on John and they wanted him to take his father's living. But in 1735 John sailed to America to be a missionary to the Indians. He returned to England a failure all the time he had no peace in himself. Now it was in 1738 which was the most decisive year in influencing John Wesley's life as an evangelist. Round about this time he was challenged by the Moravians, especially Peter Bowler. He gave John Wesley advice about preaching and the nature of salvation. He brought converts to John in order to prove that salvation by faith is true. It was at Aldersgate that John finally found peace when justification by faith became real to him in his experience. This was to make John evangelize as he wanted all the world to know that God knew his heart. A blaze for God. So it was that Aldersgate liberated John. It made his heart a blaze for God, full of love for God and humanity. He was to give his life to evangelism. He was utterly convinced that mankind needed to hear the doctrine of justification by faith. John first retreated for a short while to get ready for his life's work. Then the first trumpet blast came in 1738 at St. Mary's Church in Oxford. He preached a message of justification by faith. It was a powerful sermon, but not liked. So John kept on preaching and he started to preach in the churches. They hated his message. In 1739, John received an invitation from George Whitfield, the itinerant preacher or field preacher. Whitfield wanted John Wesley to help him with his ministry in Bristol. John went there and began to preach outside to large crowds. From April to December that year, John preached 500 times. It was 1745 that John wrote a book defending his evangelistic ministry. It was called A Further Appeal to Men of Reason and Religion. The main argument from this book was that he should be allowed to preach to the lost if nobody will, will do the job. God's man for the nation. Where did John go when he preached? Like all evangelists, he went where the people could be found. In Ireland, he preached from door a doorway. John preached in a loft in May in 1756. In Cornwall, he preached on the downs. In Yorkshire, the moors. John preached in parks, greens, benches, even shooting range. He also preached in town halls, prison hospitals and workhouses. These are just a few of the places John spread the gospel of Christ. Who did John preach to? He spoke to thieves, prostitutes, fools, the learned merchants and the poor. He often said he loved the poor. What is his method of evangelism? As it, as it has been noted, it was preaching. He believed proclamation was the primary means of evangelism. John cons consistently reminded his preachers that they had only one thing to do and that was to save souls. What was John's message? It was primarily a message of salvation. God's sovereignty and human responsibility were held together. He preached the wrath of God with a balanced invitation to receive Christ. A nation changed. The final proof of that John was an evangelist is in the lives of his converts. A William Webb at Bristol, aged 30, testified to how John's message changed his life. He saw teenagers often converted under his ministry. Even whole regions such as the West Country experienced profound spiritual renewal under John's preaching. As we read John Wesley, one proof of the evangelistic zeal of John. In March 11, 1745, he wrote to a clerical friend defending his ministry. John points out how he has been preaching salvation for seven years, and he notes how preaching this doctrine, the churches ostracized him. Then he says this made him preach in houses and wherever opportunity presented itself. This made the clergy write against him. But John then goes on to say he was not put off from doing this evangelism. He had many converts and could not leave them but had to disciple them. We get more idea of evangelist heart as we see John Luke after his converts. In May 28, 1745, John advises a lady to trust God's promises in order to receive salvation. 
in September the 18th, 1746, John warns a fellow against quietism or the stillness theology. In 1750, writing to the Sheffield Society, he warns for warmness uh, and reminds them to, to the zeal, the zeal that they once had as converts. All these can be found in John Wesley's Letters, Volume 3. We also see in his letters how John had an overwhelming passion for evangelism. In 1750, he tells a vicar he has no time to debate about water baptism. He has more important things to do, namely preach the gospel. He expresses his approval of a friend and his brother for preaching the gospel and wished there were more preachers like them. An example of this type of letter is shown below to Samuel Worker, 1779. Quotes John Wesley writes in his letter, Reverend and dear sir, I have one point of view to promote, so far as I am able, vital practical religion, and by God in the souls of men. On this single principle I have hereafter proceeded and taken no step out of in subserviency to it. End of quote. We see more evidence of John Wesley being an evangelist by organizing of the Methodist revival movement. He advises that a preacher be given a charge so he can do evangelism. He encourages Matthew Laws in 1762 to keep evangelistically ev evangelizing in winter as it is a difficult time. But he tells the man that when spring comes, he will see blessing. In 1775, John expresses delight and amazement at Samuel Barsley's area, which had broken out in small revival. He tells the chap to keep praying diligently. In 1788, he tells Henry Moore to keep evangelizing the soldiers. In 1783, John expresses hope that one of his preachers, a John Bexendale, might be settled in ministry and can soon be going about the task of evangelism. Volumes 4, 6, 8, 7, and Volumes 3 of John Wesley's Letters and Volume 5 some of the citations that I've made in this lecture. A final letter uh, of John Wesley, the evangelist, to his brother Charles Althorn, uh, Charles Wesley, in June 1767, shows the heart of John Wesley as an evangelist. Dear brother, for some time I have had many thoughts concerning the work of God in these kingdoms. I have been surprised that it has spread so far and that it has spread no farther. And what hindered? Surely the design of God was to bow a nation to his way, instead of which there is still only a Christian here and there, and the rest are yet in the shadows of death, although those who would profit by us have need to make haste, as we are not likely to serve them long. The journals and diaries of John Wesley uh, also indicate that he had a passion for evangelism, John Wesley's Journal, Volume 19. In September 13, 1738, John tells us how he preached to two churches, but these churches react negatively to his message. In June the same year, he reports how he preached to at, a, at Windsor to a small group, and he laments it. He heard a preacher who could not preach sound doctrine, that is to say, the gospel. He recounts a common event of how the, he counseled souls seeking salvation. He writes in his journal, one who has been a zealous opposer, one who has been zealous opposer of this way, sent and desired to speak with me immediately. He had all the signs of settled despair, both in his countenance and behaviour. He said he had been enslaved to sin many years, especially to drunkenness, that he had long used all the means of grace, had constantly gone to church and sacrament, had read the scriptures and knew much used much private prayer. I desired we might join in prayer. After a short space, he rose, and his countenance was no longer sad. He said, Now I know God loveth me, and has forgiven my sins, and sin shall not have dominion over me, for Christ has set me free, and according to his faith, it was unto him. End of quote. John Wesley's Journal, Volume 19, page 15. As we see in John's journal, he never loses an opportunity to speak to folk about the need of salvation. On one occasion, after preaching the gospel to a group who misunderstood him, he returns to make sure they understand his message. In his journal, he reveals a tremendous conviction in the promises of the Bible. That is, if his seekers believe in the word, they shall experience truth.
as we look at the hymns, they too show us um, a passion for evangelism from John. First of all, these hymns were eminently biblical. Also, one must remember how significant these hymns were for Methodism. It has been said that Methodism was born in song, Franz Chadle Brand. It must be realized, too, that these hymns were not just thrown together. No, they were put together according to Christian experience. Although John Wesley wrote a few of these hymns, he did see them as an opportunity to reinforce his agenda of proclaiming vital religion. Finally, it must be realized that as John has the editor, he stood behind his brother who wrote most of the collection. Him too was an exposition of Luke 14, 6, 24. Talks about an invitation for sinners to come to the gospel feast. Verse 3 describes sinners as restless, wanderers, poor, that, that is, until they rest in Christ. Verse 4, verses 4 exhort once again the seeker to freely come to Christ with a promise that God is good. And all this indicates John's predilection for evangelism. The hymn continues, my message as from God receive, you all may come to Christ and live. O oh, let his love your hearts constrain, nor suffer him to die in vain. His love is mighty to compel, his conquering love consent to feel. Yield to his love's restless power, and fight against your God no more. Hymn 3 invites those who thirst to come to Christ. It is faith in the blood that saves. In verse 6, in hymn 6, verse 3 confronts the individual with the raft of questions about salvation. One example is, will you still refuse to live? In hymn 8, verse 1, the great cost of salvation is highlighted. In hymn 9, verse 2, reveals how God is loved. Hymn 10 proclaims Jesus as Savior of all. Hymn 105 describes Jesus as the fulfillment of people's heart's desire. Hymn 106 talks about the debt Jesus paid for sinners. Finally, hymn 111 offers for, describes folk who are self-righteous cannot get into heaven. All this again shows the editor John Wesley had a heart to reach to folk with the gospel. Then as we analyze John Wesley's sermons, we see an, how passionate he was about evangelism. But we cannot just dip into these sermons without realizing some important issues. One point is it was John's aim to speak plainly to his audience. His exegesis was based upon the Bible, guided by tradition and reason. This point is most significant. Um, um, collections of his sermons are in volume one. The first sermon we shall examine is John's Salvation by Faith, preached at St. Mary's, Oxford, June the 11th, 1738. John begins by saying we receive God's grace each day. He then moves on in man, on, in on man's self, sa, sorry, he then moves on to man's self-righteousness. He points out that folk can't save themselves. Folk have hearts that are born to corruption and this can only breed more corruption. John then asks some questions as to what faith is. Faith for John is to be in Christ. This, he says, is different from the faith of the heathen. John continues to describe what salvation is through this faith. Quote, And first, whatsoever else it implies, it is present salvation. It is present salvation. It is something attainable, ye actually attained on earth by the for thus says the apostle to the believers at Ephesus and in them to the believers of all ages, you shall be, though that, also, though that it also is true, but you are saved through faith. John, can, end of quote. John continues this salvation is from the guilt of the past. Folks are also saved from the power of sin. John then deals with objections to this teaching. Some said it destroys the works. Others said it makes void true faith. John stoutly denies the first charge. He states that he certainly expects his converts to do good works. He tells his hearers that his message is not like that. It destroys the found. He tells his hearers that his message is not like that, that it destroys the foundation of Catholicism. He notes how Luther was criticized for teaching the gospel.
uh, to consider is number two in the collection. It was preached at St. Mary's Oxford on July 25th, 1741, upon the text Acts 28, 20, 26, Acts chapter 26, 28. John gets his audience ready for the punch at the end. He points out how the heathen are very honest and sincere. He then rounds on his listeners. He shows them how you can be honest but not saved. On the sermon goes cutting down, uh, sorry, the sermon goes on and cuts down folks' false views of salvation. John then gives a personal testimony that he was a person who tried to earn salvation, but then he realized that he could not. The final sermon to look at is number 110. This reveals John's theology of evangelism. His thesis here is that God and this love is free and for all it does not depend on the human merit John then rounds on Calvinism he has no time for the doctrine of election as stated by Calvinists this doctrine destroys holiness and love for mankind the sermon ends with a grand and bold decoration for the view that Christ died for all you can look up also uh, volume 1 volume 3 and uh, of John Wesley's sermons so Here's the question. What evidence is there for John Wesley's life and work that he was an evangelist? We have seen that his nation was in moral crisis. John could not, not have ignored this as a minister. We have seen how John's early life, his parents and the, and the saving from the fire were powerful factors that shaped John to be an evangelist. It took him a long time to find peace with God and he was hardly likely to keep this just what took him so long to find it, it would only take him a few minutes to share so that others might enter into the experience he had. So why not? John's life was one of a preaching evangelist. We have seen the lengths he would go to to share the gospel. John's letters we have seen reveal a man who is ever concerned to counsel his converts. The journals show a man concerned to direct a, re direct a revival with the end goal of being a missionary orientated. The hymn show John's choice was always to make men consider their eternal state. Finally, the sermon shows how John was always concerned to press upon the public the need to find true peace with God. We see his theology, free grace, the love of God for all in Christ. This is what drove John to be an evangelist. On the basis of this evidence, John lies was mainly the life of an evangelist. It's used to all in every place, in every condition, without fear. So we come to the end and we're just going to conclude with a few thoughts about the relevance of all this for today. It is clear to all, as it should be to you, that there is a crisis, a national crisis within the United Kingdom, morally speaking. And there is also a national crisis in the American nation. The church needs to rediscover the gospel and she needs to proclaim that gospel far and wide to those who do not know it. She needs to rediscover the confidence in the gospel and she needs to be willing to venture all to spread that gospel to those who are willing to hear. America desperately needs more John Wesley's today. And the UK, you can be a John Wesley today by simply confessing your sin and believing in Christ that he died for you. And then going out and spreading the gospel to all those in your area. Whether it be on the internet, whether it be preaching, whether it be whatever you can do to spread that gospel. But also we need to be in prayer because if we're in a crisis, only God can help us. I encourage you to study more of the Great Awakening at the time of John Wesley and George Whitfield, and also of Jonathan Edwards in America. I would encourage you to study that literature and to be inspired by it. About the great Countess of Huntington, how she was converted and used her wealth in that great revival. About the great Hannah Moore, who used her playwriting skills to write plays. 
in revival. And so I would encourage you to remember the great revival of the John Wesley's time. He was one man, but there were other men and women used in that revival. Great preachers, great evangelists, and it affected the all of culture. William Wilberforce became an MP and he also got converted in this time of revival. And he went on to stop slavery in the Western world. Hannah Moore went on to be a great playwright. Cassidy of Onterton went on to be a great philanthropist. All through this revival, all through the preaching of the Word of God. So, it is not apologetics that we need at the present time. It is a great awakening. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a revival. And the revival and expect the power of God to move. I believe in apologetics and I am committed to doing apologetics. But I'm also committed to the preaching of the gospel and I'm committed to the revival of the church and I'm committed to the proclamation of the word. But I'm also committed to the Holy Spirit for without him we can do nothing. So pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon the church in the West and revive the church in the West. So may God bless you and may this lecture do some good. Please feel free to use this lecture to make a DVD and pass it on to your church family if you want to. And may God bless you. This is Jason Burns signing out.